Hey everybody. Um, so first off, I, I have to record this lecture and post it uh, up on YouTube or potentially on Sakai. So that's why we're having a slightly different style format of uh, lecture this week. I'm, I'm on travel and unfortunately have absolutely terrible internet. Um, there's no way that this internet would support a collaborate session. And so uh, I have to record it and actually I will be uh, busy during part of today's lecture time, so uh, a little bit of a change up this week, but hopefully this works out well, and hopefully you guys don't mind. So, oops. okay. So, quick summary from last class: um, we we talked about kind of an introduction to reliability engineering and some of the concepts and theory, and ran through an airport risk example. And then we had planned to jump into the probability and statistics, at least kind of the introduction to that last time, which didn't happen. So that's actually what we're going to cover today, which I'll show in just a second. In terms of announcements, DP1 overall was good. I will post these grades uh, sometime today. I actually tried posting them tonight, and the Internet would not allow it. <laughs> so I will have to go find some better Internet um, after, you know, sometime later tonight. But I'll get those posted up. Uh, overall, they were good, but one of the biggest issues that I noticed was the functional modeling. So there were a few functional models that I thought were, were pretty much spot on from what we had covered in the lecture. But to be honest, by and large, they were more process-based diagrams. Okay, so, so I made some pretty detailed comments. I spent many, many hours grading DP1 because I thought it was uh, important to give you guys some, some detailed feedback. And so, I, I, for each one of you, I've left detailed comments on the functional model if I thought something needed to be different. But uh, really, what, what I saw was, was more steps in a process as opposed to functions. So, it's good to keep in mind that functions are verb, noun, pairs. So, they're actions. They're actions on things. Um, also, functional models typically have quite a bit of flow between the boxes. What I also saw some of was kind of a single flow and also an unlabeled flow, so it doesn't mean much, right? Um, and a single unlabeled flow between all the boxes, which doesn't really provide much value, right? So you think about a function, think about like the black box function as an example. You have a variety of flows coming in and then a function affecting those and some different flows going out. Maybe some the same, maybe some different. With, uh, for example, the vacuum, right? You, you may have some... Uh, air coming in and some air going out, but it takes air, you know, and that suction to actually make the vacuum work. So, in again, in a lot of the functional models, they were somewhat basic with with very minimal flow. So, uh, some of you I've encouraged to go back to lecture two and check out some of the functional models there. See see the five step process again. And the goal there is that it needs to be updated, you know, with whatever comments I've left before the end of the term because the last DP assignment is going to be a summarization of all the, the previous reports. Okay, so uh, I guess you have until the end of the term until, you know, it's ready to be fixed up. But good to keep in mind. Okay, so today's journey is really going to be the introduction to probability and stats and, and actually getting into some of the actual reliability involved with that. Um, I've got this disclaimer here. I'm not going to cover that immediately, but I, I will talk about my disclaimer to reliability predictions here shortly. Okay, so let's jump into the probability and stats. Actually, I guess kind of a summary on top of that. In terms of definitions, so one of the definitions of reliability is, is what's shown here, the probability that a system or product will accomplish its uh, designated function in a satisfactory manner for a given period of time when used under specified operating conditions. The only thing I want to point out here, because we talked about this, these definitions before, is really that we can see in some ways that reliability can be modeled as a probability. Okay, it's not the only thing that's important. There's a bunch of other underlying stuff there, but it it can it can be uh, it can be modeled as a probability. Okay, so that's the important thing. And then the probability definition stated in quantitative terms representing a fraction or a percent percentage specifying the number of times that one can expect an event to occur in a total number of trials. 
So, um, so for example, probability of survival of an item operating 80 hours is 75 or 0.75 or 75%. So we'd interpret this if we're if we're thinking about reliability as a probability, we could interpret this as expect the item to function properly for at least 80 hours, 75 out of 100 times. Okay. So one of the overall goals of the slide is really to show you that um, reliability can be thought of as a probability. In, in, tr in fact, really, most people think of it as a probability, which actually it causes more issue than, than benefit. Okay, so uh, as we talked about with uncertainty in the class so far, there's somewhat of a stochastic nature to engineering. Uh, so, so the second bullet point here, uh, it, it can be expected that things fail uh, without, without uh, previous knowledge at different points in time and so on and so forth. And so really as a, a because of the way that that occurs, it lends well to statistical modeling, probability-based modeling. Really, the why, one of the, the reasons why we describe reliability from a probability standpoint is, is really the uncertainty and stochastic nature of engineering. Because if you look across engineering or you look across the systems that you guys work on every day, there are massive amounts of uncertainty. I mean, they're all over the place. Okay. <clears throat> so I guess here's a couple of examples of some of that uncertainty. Um, so engineering or environmental parameters are certainly random variables, random, random variables that contain uncertainty. Uh, temperature, this is an interesting one because if you think about just about any system out there that, that operates in, in a non-ideal environment obviously sees a variety of temperatures you know there's there's of course systems that operate in in very highly specified environments but uh you know you think of a submarine you think of a missile you know like an air, air to ground missile is, is going from you know a very cold temperature ultimately down to a warmer temperature uh so from a reliability standpoint for example you know when you're doing some predictive Techniques you might be asking yourself, well, what temperature should I use? Which one's important? Uh, do I break that mission up into multiple timelines so I can maybe get a little bit more accurate estimate by assuming multiple temperatures and uh, ultimately kind of pushing the results together? But you know, there could be, for example, it could be that there's a cold temperature at first, but then there's a boundary layer of warmer temperature, and then there's colder underneath, but Overall, it tends to warm up as the, the weapon drops from up high to down low. But again, you know, what temperature is the right temperature? There's certainly uncertainty in that, right? When something will fail, uh, data reuse from similar systems or other systems is an important topic for uncertainty. Um, anyway, so on and so forth. So the, the point here is that there are, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in engineering, and it's important, I guess, to understand that. Uh, Here's the more of the disclaimer so slide that I will I will uh, make a point on before we get into any predictive analytics. So the first point that you guys should clearly understand is that every failure is predictable. Okay, so every the, and, and this is this is a very true statement, but it's a little bit hard for some people to to fully grasp when they're told this. Uh, and I've, I've had this conversation with a variety of people before, and sometimes I get a lot of pushback, and other times I don't. But the fact is, everything's predictable. Everything's predictable when you know the right information. Okay? So, you know, if you think about a system, right, and, and a system failing, and, you know, we often perceive these as random failures. Well, they're random failures because of the way that we perceive them and the way that we model them. Right? If you're observing failures on a system and you're ultimately breaking it down to a failure rate, that failure rate basically says that you see so many failures every so many hours, and it's, it's kind of a smooth across number. 
and it's it's random. We actually call it the random part of the bathtub curve, which we'll see in a little while, um, which is which is true. The way that we're modeling it makes it random. Uh, but that said, if if in fact you were to dive down at a deeper level, a higher level of fidelity, potentially even into the physics of what's going on, it would be such that this randomness and this uncertainty would be more discrete. It'd be more like a light switch or a binary type of setup where you would have variables in the system that you could move up or down and that would cause a failure or not cause a failure. So, so that go back to the point is that the, it's, it's really the way that we model reliability and uncertainty that leads to the statistics and probability being used. But it is important to understand that anything is predictable with the right amount of information. So I guess overall the, the question is, is it good or is it bad to use probability and statistics or predictive reliability systems? Um, so what I've observed is that, for example, one of the common shortfalls is that we derive a requirement to predict reliability, then we use a variety of different means to get to the point where we predict the reliability, and then we turn around and derive new and future requirements based on our history of habits and how we've predicted reliability. And it's kind of the snowball effect. Eventually, it picks up and everybody does it, and that's kind of how it works. Um, predictive reliability, the way in which it's actually done in practice, and some of you guys I'm sure have seen this, is actually quite simple. Uh, it, it's just not a – and it's actually – the way that it's done, I don't – we won't get to today. That will be next class. But – uh, we'll, we'll cover we'll cover more of the fundamentals and, and really how, more of how it kind of should be done in this class, but I'll, I'll talk about it more next class. But the way that it's done is actually quite simple, and when things are quite simple, people understand it, and everybody has an opinion, and when you start to get more complicated, it tends to be that those types of methods are, are often turned down. Uh, and so as a result, we like to go with kind of simple approaches and, and that's really the way that practitioners historically have handled predictive reliability. Um, so one other question to ask yourselves, especially you on those of you that are on a current program doing reliability, is what the value of the predictions are for your system. Um, and so this is an important question to answer, right? Because you could ask yourself, well, once the predictions are done and we've, we've found a number, whether we believe the number or not, um, what do we do with them? You know, what's the value in that, right? Does Do those calculations, as an example, do they play into a bigger architecture? Uh, I've seen both ways. I have seen where they do play into a bigger architecture, which has value as long as the numbers are good. Uh, if the numbers aren't good, it's sort of like a garbage in, garbage out, and then eventually it doesn't have any value at all. But um, in often cases, predictions are actually, they're, developed and they take an insane amount of time, thousands and thousands of hours for, for relatively simple, complex systems. Um, but they're often developed and then they're archived. So somebody signs off on them, says thanks for doing it, you met the requirement. Obviously we meet requirements in systems engineering and now that we're done, we're done. We're going to put it away and we're going to just know that that box is checked. Okay. So I, I'm imagining that those of you listening to this slide are, are probably uh, able to understand my hesitancy and probably my uh, philosophy on predictive reliability. Um, so I'll just go ahead and come out and say it. I don't believe that it's a valuable activity in general, because uh, partly because of the way it's implemented in organizations and... Uh, and partly because we typically don't have the real good data to actually truly uh, implement and predict good reliability. And I have talked to a very, very large number of people on this topic and uh, some, some pretty key people in the reliability community actually over the last few days because I'm currently at a reliability 
symposium. And uh, it, it's, it's really becoming more of a common theme in the reliability community that predictive analytics and predictive reliability are something that we would like to steer away from because they do, it actually does more harm than it does good. And in fact, I will uh, track down an article and post it on our site to give you guys a research article to show that. Okay. But, but that said, it, it is currently... Predictive reliability is currently something that's done as a part of organizations, and I think it's important to cover, and I want to make sure you guys do understand it. Uh, so that is really where we're headed right now. But I do encourage you guys, if you have questions, especially if you're in your cor current organization and you have requirements or, or maybe even are developing requirements for new programs, and you're going down this path of predicting reliability, should be asking the question, what value is this adding? Is it really going to add value to the system that I'm designing? Is it going to help me to make decisions for that system? Because that's really what reliability is about, right? Is it going to help change the system in a more reliable way? And and if you have questions, even, you know, that you want to come out and pose to me, I'd be happy to, to give you more input on this or even talk to the folks at your organization because it's a, it's a pretty important topic. Okay, so now we're done with the disclaimer. So let's talk about probability and statistics. Uh, so this slide's really about deterministic versus probabilistic. And so really, deterministic is, is when you know everything, right? So it's, I like this example here of money in a bank account. So let's say you have $1,000 in your bank account, and you add $1,000 more. It's not really an uncertain thing right? It's, it's very much a known thing, right? You end up with $2,000 in your account. And, and if someone takes $50 out, then you have $1,950. It's not really a question. It's, it's just truth. We just know what the answer is. So that's an example of deterministic. And you'll see to the left of the purple text, I've mentioned the consequence of a failure mode. So just got to be a little bit careful with this one because sometimes consequence can be a little bit fuzzy, but you know, if you think about, I'm using consequence as an example, because in general, when we think about the consequence of our system when it fails, in general, we have a pretty darn good idea of what that consequence is. And so I was thinking about like the example of the axle and maybe the drive shaft in a car relative to it yielding. So if, if the drive shaft or an axle on a car yields, which means it physically separates, the result is that you have no power output to either one or more of the, the uh, wheels, right? So, because power goes from the engine out to the wheels, right, through those shafts. And that's not really a, an uncertain thing, right? It's, it's a pretty well-known thing, right? And, and that, that has uh, kind of a nice thread through the consequence side of uh, the, kind of the way that we do risk engineering. So I kind of think of, of consequence as deterministic. Probabilistic, though, is the other side, right? It's when we have uncertainty, that, that, that stuff that we don't know, right? The uncertainty, the, stochast the stochastic nature of something. Uh, this gives the example of roll a dice and, uh, I guess, roll a die until it comes up with a five, you know? So the uncertainty was like, how many rolls is it going to take to come up with a five, you know? Um, or roll dice 10 times and try to understand what those 10 rolls will yield type of thing, right? And so my example for probabilistic is the likelihood of a failure mode, right? So we have kind of consequence likelihood, right? Put those together, that's a risk. Deterministic is more the consequence. Probabilistic is more the likelihood. Okay, so... Now we'll talk about these things called random variables, which are, of course, an important thing in probability and statistics. The definition of a random variable is a variable whose value is subject to variation due to chance, right? It's probability, it's uncertainty, it's the stuff we've been talking about, right? So now there's two different kinds of random variables, and, and these are actually kind of an important difference because the way that we predict reliability for our systems comes down to these two approaches. Well, it's based on these two philosophies, okay? So discrete random variables uh, are, are those that have either a countable or a known set of outcomes, okay? The, the number of faces on a dice is an example, right? So there's only 
for standard dice, right? There's only six sides to a dice. So you can't roll a dice and get an eight. It just doesn't exist. It's not there. It's not going to happen. You know, and of course there's, you could argue this, you could say, well, what if you roll a dice and it lands on a corner and, you know, it doesn't land on a side? Well, we're not talking about that, right? We're talking just standard stuff, right? You roll a dice, you get one through six. That's all you get. That's all, that's all there is. There, and if you, you know, flip a coin, you have heads, you have tails. That's, a, again, another discrete random variable. Okay. Continuous random variables are, of course, continuous. So these can take on an infinite number of values. Measuring things tends to be a continuous thing. So measuring the length of something, right? So it's, you know, you can, you can take something that's about a foot wide and, and measure it. Uh, but it can be, you know, the, the idea of, of measuring something, you know, is, is very much a continuous thing because you can always get down to a smaller size, right? I mean, you can measure down to the angstrom, for example, right? So very, very minute size. So it's very much a continuous thing. I give the example of a, a weight of a rock. Okay, so now let's let's go from random, and by the way, we'll talk more about random variables and, and that stuff. Now let's bring up the idea of statistical distributions. I'm sure that all of you guys have heard of distributions, probably know varying amounts about them. Uh, distributions can be an important part about reliability. They're used in a couple of different ways, but I'll read through the definition. In probability and statistics, a probability distribution assigns a probability to each measurable subset of possible outcomes of, of a random experiment, survey, procedure, or statistical inference. Okay, so let's take just a second here and look at the distribution along the bottom. And this is, which I'll talk about shortly, is a probability density function, or also known as a PDF. And what this is showing, and actually the, the axes aren't labeled, which is kind of uh, not helpful, but the vertical axis is probability, and the horizontal axis in this case, all this is really showing is the variation or standard deviation from the mean value. But really, it's try. It, it, this is just displaying any random variable, continuous random variable, most likely, but a random variable along the x-axis. So let's just take, for example, the random variable of time. Okay, so let's just say, let's see, here will be a time value of zero, we'll say. Here could maybe be a thousand hours, and four sigma would we'll just say it's 2,000 hours. And of course, these are, you know, like 250 hour increments, right? So what this is really showing, because we'll, we'll talk about this in terms of reliability, this, is, this would be showing, uh, for example, the time to failure of a specific part okay so just imagine that we've taken a thousand parts and we've tested them you know all under the same conditions and all that stuff and we've just measured their performance and the performance is irrelevant but we can say they're either working or they're not working we've measured their performance and we waited for them to fail and at some point in time they fail and we record that value and we do that over and over and over and over and then we throw those numbers at this distribution and or we throw it at a graph and the result is the distribution, right? This is like a very smooth histogram, right? So you'd be binning these. You'd be saying, which ones fail between zero hours and 250 hours? Uh, you know, how many fail between 250 and 500 hours and so on and so forth. And in fact, you'd probably get much more discreet. You'd probably, you know, maybe do this down to like the five or 10 minute intervals. But ultimately it builds this distribution here. And so, as an example, once we have the distribution, and, you know, this is the result, we can ask ourselves some pretty interesting questions. Like, for example, if I, this is going to be the random variable again, if I randomly sample a new component from that same population that built this, and I test it, what's the probability it will exceed 1,000 hours? Okay, that, that's a good question. That sounds like a reliability type of question we'd ask ourselves. And the answer is right in front of us, right? So if you look at the middle here, here this again is our 1,000 hours. We would ask, if, if we pull a new one out and we just test it, what's the, what's the chance or probability it'll exceed 1,000 hours? Well, it's 34.1 plus 13.6 plus 2.1 plus 0 .0, or 0 0.1, right? That's everything to the right 
under the curve of 1,000 ohms, which adds up to 50%, right? And we can ask this type of stuff all day long. Like, what's the, what's the probability that that new random sample will last between 1,250 and $1,500? Well, it's 13.6, right? So... So this, again, the point of this slide is to kind of present this idea of a distribution, and, and so I kind of wanted to uh, present it in sort of a reliability type of way. And we'll come back to distributions kind of over and over. Or even specifically the PDF I showed there. Okay, so this slide is showing for every distribution... We can essentially classify them, or, or one way we can measure our distributions is using these things called moments. Okay, and some moments you've probably heard of, uh, and some moments you probably haven't heard of, most likely. So distribution has four four moments: they're mean, standard deviation, skewness, and kurtosis. Okay, those are the four things that make up a distribution. I will say, uh, understanding. The moments is it, it might have some value, but but to be honest, I I think just kind of understanding that these exist, uh, I think is probably the most valuable thing, at least from what I've seen in practice. And so you can look like, for example, in the graph on the top right just gives some idea on what these things mean, right? The means in the middle, standard deviation is kind of how fat it is, the skewness is kind of kind of like how how much to the side it is, which is actually shown probably best with the bottom left and uh, bottom center graph. And the kurtosis is like this, how odd shaped is the distribution overall. Uh, from what I've seen is the, the skewness and kurtosis don't really get talked about. Uh, we like standard deviation mean a lot more, probably because they're easier to understand. But... Uh, Ultimately, uh, they, they don't provide a whole lot of value. I mean, if we're looking to, to you know, identify a distribution, there, there's plenty of software that will automatically do that. So understanding the kurtosis and skewness at a deeper level, it probably just doesn't provide a whole lot of value. But it is important to understand that there are four moments that make up a distribution. Uh, let's take a, a kind of a quick sidestep here. This is just an interesting example. So Penelope is this cow in the picture here. Uh, and what happened was there was, uh, just to kind of show, you know, there is definitely some value to statistics in case that earlier it sounded like I was trying to say there wasn't. There's, there's a lot of value to probability statistics. It's just the way that it's used that has the issue. Uh, so, so what uh, somebody did is they measured, well, they measured the weight of Penelope, first of all. And then they said, you know, how much does she weigh? But then they asked a bunch of people to estimate, just by looking at Penelope, just estimate the weight of Penelope. Actually, we're not going to do it. In, in the past, I had done this as more of a class exercise. Uh, but, of course, we can't do that in this situation. Um, so they took 17,205 people, so a really large number of people, and those the and everybody guessed Penelope's weight. So the average guess of all those 12, 17,000 people was 1,287 pounds. So if you were to do this activity, you might ask, you know, how, how much would I guess? And, and by the way, 1,287 is not the real answer, but you might ask, by looking at Penelope, you know, what would you estimate her weight at? So here's what the results looked like. Okay, again, what the researcher did was they took everybody's guess, they threw it out a histogram, and this is what it looked like. So again, the average and, and the blue, just to be clear, the blue data, the blue histogram is the estimated data. That's what everybody threw at it. So the average estimated data is 1,287 pounds. Penelope's actual weight is 1,355. But what's interesting overall is how accurate a, a fairly uncertain guess was able to provide for Penelope's weight. You know, and, and you can see that, well, if you, if, you, if you randomly took, let's say, 10 samples out of this distribution, 
there's a chance you might get some answers that are like 300 and some that are like 3,000, right? So they're, those are wildly off. But if you look at enough data, the data works itself out in a way that shows that, well, the average estimate is actually pretty good. So this, this to me, is one of the values of statistics, is taking a large amount of data, understanding it, and and then being able to use that large amount of data in a practical way. So in this case, you know, the practical way is to estimate a cow's weight, which of course is not terribly relevant, but it at least has a clear and understandable reason, right? If you, you your the goal is to estimate the weight, right? And estimating the weight has got to have some relevance down the road. I don't know what that is. We'll say it has relevance, but in this case, you know, a large number of samples was able to lead to a pretty good result. So this is all the stuff I just said. Excuse me. Okay, so let's now talk about probability density functions. Okay, so this is, again, I've got the same graphic on the bottom. Just to reiterate that this is uh, a PDF. Uh, and the way that we typically... The, the reason that we typically build PDFs in predictive reliability is for time-based failures, right? So we understand that the random variable is time, and we build a distribution, such as the one along the bottom, to understand when we expect things to fail. Now, that's, that's not the only way that we do it. It doesn't have to be time. And in fact, we'll also talk about stress strength later, so stress is another way, is another random variable that we could measure. And in fact, strength is actually a random variable as well. Strength is actually measured in the same units as stress. And we can build PDFs of that stuff as well. Uh, and, and in fact, we'll, we'll get that. But, but actually, by and large, uh, what, what reliability engineers typically look at is time-based distributions. And that's why you see this equation in the middle which is just kind of a, a, a very, very generic equation to say that f of t, which is the PDF, is a function of time, and it's specifically the derivative of the time-based derivative of another function, which we'll talk about in a minute, okay? And I have a statement along the bottom that PDF's not really that useful. It really depends on how you look at them. The one here on the bottom actually is useful because it's got these nice areas under the curve filled in. Typically, PDFs don't have that, and that's actually why I made that statement. Typically, a PDF, you know, would it'd be a curve, but it wouldn't have any, any numbers inside that curve. And so those by themselves, you actually can't get much information out of. So them by themselves, are, they're, they're, they're not that valuable. They're, this one just is because it's got some of those numbers. So I guess on this slide, on the left side, what I'm, I'm showing is a, a normal distribution PDF. On the right side is an exponential distribution. Uh, and again, uh, I guess I kind of covered some of this, but left side, the vertical axes are probability. The horizontal axis, in this case, is standard deviation. So it doesn't actually indicate what that random variable being measured is. It actually could be anything at this point. It could be stress, it could be time, it could be something else. Um, so these, these slides are not showing specifically what that random variable is. Um, but again, usually it's going to be time. Uh, normal distributions are something we're quite familiar with, which is why I showed that here. So normal distributions are, you know, you look at that and it just seems kind of familiar. Exponential distributions, unless you've been in reliability, they're probably not all that familiar to you. So this is what a PDF of an exponential distribution looks like, which basically says that the distribution, you know, exponentially degrades over time. Okay, and actually that's that's what the reliability looks like, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So th this this top line here is actually the reason why I said PDFs aren't that useful, and it's really because. PDFs are, they don't show you anything immediately. You have to actually, you have to 
integrate them or you have to get the area under the curve to actually get any useful information out of them. So that's, what, that's really the only reason why I said that they're not useful. But let's take an example, you know, uh, so the, for example, the probability that uh, we'll say the random variable x here, probability x equals 2, we'll say the random variable of x is time to failure. So let's say the probability that, let's say we're trying to predict the probability that a unit fails exactly to the moment at two years. Well, because of the way the PDFs work, the probability that it fails at that instantaneous point in time is actually zero. So again, PDFs have to be looked at as an area under the curve, or they don't make any sense. Right? The width of the line is zero, and thus the area is zero. And we're looking for area. Area is the, the only valuable thing that we can pull out of a PDF, which is why, actually, ultimately, we'll look at a different distribution, which we'll talk about in just a second. So, for example, this is like saying that the probability the system fails exactly after 10 years, 54 days, 3 hours, 8 minutes, 12 seconds is, you know, and again, it's zero, right? Um, better question would be, what is the probability the system fails between deployment and that 10-year, 54 days, so on and so forth, right? So now we've established not an immediate time that we care about. We've established a time frame. Right between deployment, so t equals zero, and this other ten years, fifty-four days time, and it's that type of uh, question that gets us useful information. And so, by thinking that way, and 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 by the way, in reliability, you know, from a practitioner's point of view, you will often be failed. Uh, sorry, you will often be asked, you know, what. What's the reliability at a certain time? Or what's the probability it'll fail at a certain time? Uh, and so you just have to understand those questions and really understand what somebody's asking. So the reliability at a certain time is the integral of the PDF between zero, when it starts being used, and whatever time someone's asking for. And so that's just something that you just have to, as a reliability engineer, you have to understand that they're not asking for a particular time. They're actually, in fact, asking for a time frame between zero and whatever value, okay? So now we'll present this new idea, which is this capital F of T. So again, the PDF is the little f of T. There's this thing now that we'll talk about that's the capital F of T, which we'll say is the, the probability that a randomly sampled part or system or whatever it may be fails at less than or equal to a time, right? And again, what I was kind of like what I was just explaining, but what we would do is we would integrate, because we're asking about a time, and we'll say again, it's just 10 years, 54 days. So we're asking about a particular time. So we would integrate from negative infinity all the way up to that time value. We would integrate f of little, little f of t, which is the PDF. And of course, it's a time-based function, so we're integrating across dt. That's going to produce a new distribution, one that we can actually just look at and find information directly. So then the question is, what is big F of t? The big F of t is a cumulative distribution function of the CDF. I'm sure many of you guys have probably heard this before. You know, we've heard PDF and CDF. I always get the Ds wrong because there's probability density function, which is PDF, and there's cumulative distribution function. I'm sure at some point I'll switch those Ds, but... Um, so the CDF indicates the probability at any particular time. So it's a continuous integration of the PDF over a time, okay? Probably the easiest way to understand this is to look at the bottom two graphs. We'll take, as an example, the red distribution and the left side graph, the PDF, which looks, you know, sort of like a normal distribution. It's not, it's a wibble, but you guys are probably more familiar with normal. So it looks kind of normal-ish, but it's really steep, right? It goes up and down really fast and, you know, it ultimately goes to zero pretty quickly. And then you look at the right side graph, you can imagine integrating, right? Integrating, you're adding up things over time or over the independent variable along the bottom. And so as a result, because the sharp turn up and down of the PDF 
the CDF on the right side adds up and gets up to its maximum value very quickly. And it's important to understand that once the PDF on the left side approximately gets to zero, because really it never gets there technically, when it approximately gets to zero, the CDF, which is on the right side, is going to flatten out. It's going to stop accumulating more, uh, more area under the curve, right? Because there's nothing more to add. So again, we'll take just a different example. If you're looking at the graph on the left side, you look at that purplish line, which is the furthest to the right. It's very broad, very high standard deviation. Uh, the graph on the right side shows a very slow or sluggish type of accumulation. Okay? So if we were to integrate the PDF on the left side of the purple distribution, uh, we would get, let's see, it's a little bit difficult to see the values, but we'll say the average is about, I don't know, 2.8 or so. 2.8 is about where this distribution hits its kind of halfway point. And it's not it's not a normal distribution, so it's not necessarily 100% balanced. Uh, it it could, could have a little bit of skewness to it. But if we just come over to this side, this side uh, the CDF, and we go to 2.8 and try to go up, it's about at 50%, right? And that's exactly what we would expect, okay? Because, again, it's added up about half of the area under the curve of the PDF. So then the question is, is the CDF the reliability? Well, let's hope not, because if every system or part started with a reliability of zero, we'd be out of business, All right? So it's not quite the reliability, it's pretty close. In fact, the reliability is 1 minus the CDF. You can kind of see that in the middle of the screen here. But it, and it makes sense, right? Because the CDF goes from 0. Because the, the, the PDF is something that goes, essentially goes up and goes down for the most part, right? And so the, to add up, when you initially start adding 0, uh, you're going to be at, you're going to start at 0 and add 0, so it's going to, the CDF always kind of goes out a little bit first. So, uh, you know, you could imagine that starting starting at zero and going to one is, is entirely backwards for reliability. So it, it makes sense that it would be one minus that. In either case, that's really the truth. And of course, reliability always starts at one and degrades over time. And reliability also never increases. So that's something we'll, we will talk about a little bit later. We can perceive it as increasing, but it doesn't actually increase. Okay, so let's run through a quick example here. Uh, I was thinking about an example of, uh, you know, if you have an event the following day, so let's say there's a, a special event that you, you know, would like to attend tomorrow, and there's, of course, always some chance that it can rain. And I came from, I, I grew up in Oregon, so the chance was like 99% every day. Willamette Valley like never stops raining. It's incredible. But uh, we'll say that there's some chance that it's going to, to rain tomorrow, and we've got an event, and the event's sort of important, and so maybe we have to invest some money in it, and if it rains, we lose all our money, and if it's sunny, then we're good, or something like that. But we're interested in if it's going to rain tomorrow or not. Okay. Uh, so we use the rain height as the random variable, okay? And that's that's the oh, and sorry, it's it's tomorrow. The amount of rain that tomorrow will receive is the random variable. So we'll just you know say it's like all 24 hours is something we care about. So if what it, however much it rains tomorrow is is what we care about. That's the random variable. We don't know the answer to it yet. It's it's the random variable, okay? Um, so I'm going to show you this example in a minute where I make a table and, and I, I'm going to put some probabilities in it. They're not real probabilities, but just to show the example. Um, it's important to understand that in the end that all those probabilities add up to 100%, which I'll show in a second. Things like negative probabilities, and they're not allowed. We don't like negative probabilities. They do weird things to the stats. Uh, and then they're not meaningful in reliability anyway. Um, 
So we want to ask, ask ourselves questions like, what's the probability that it rains exactly two inches tomorrow? Um, what's the probability that it rains between one and two and a half inches? Um, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so I made this table up and these are just example values. So we can think about uh, the rain height, which is the uh, far left column in inches, we'll say. So we could say, and in fact, I think the third column is actually real data, but I don't remember. I put this example together a while ago. But the first column is showing, okay, between, so zero indicates really between zero and 0 0.24999. Uh, and then the 0 0.25 is 0 0.25 to 0 0.4999 and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are actually kind of big. So we could, we could model the rain as an example as a normal distribution, or I'm sorry, as a uniform distribution. So uniform distribution means that it's essentially flat line. So it doesn't change height. The PDF doesn't change height at all. It's just flat, okay? So that would be one way to model the rain. But of course, that's not accurate, right? Because there's not the same chance tomorrow it's gonna rain four inches as it's gonna rain between you know, zero and a half inch, for example, or you know, basically a quarter inch. There's a much higher chance of, of less rain than there is of four inches. Uh, so then we can look at a, a non-uniform distribution, which, by the way, this is a weird way to say it. A non-uniform distribution really is, I mean, it could be any other distribution out there. I'm just kind of, I'm, what I'm saying here is that I, I'm showing a, a uniform distribution just as an example, uh, which is a very poor way to model rain. And then looking at just a different way to model more of an exponential type of model of rain, right? So we'll say that there's a, basically, if you look at the numbers in the third column from 200% all the way down to 0.04%, you can kind of see that the, that, and I'll show you on the next slide, that there's really, it's an exponential decaying curve, which means that very low amounts of rain have a very high chance. And as the, as we, increase the random variable from zero all the way up to four, it quickly degrades, okay? Uh, one point to, to, uh, to put on here is, you, you might be noticing that I said everything has to add up to 100%, but I have values that are clearly, if you just add the column up, they're much bigger than 100%. What's going on here is that the, the percentages in the columns are actually multiplied by the width of the histogram. So they actually get multiplied or divided by four, essentially multiplied by a quarter. And that's why you're seeing these, these huge numbers, just because they're, they're actually uh, not, they the width of the histogram within the distribution does not have a value of one, it has a value of a quarter. So that, that just gets a little bit confusing. Okay, here's that same table. I cut out the uniform distribution because I'm, what I'm showing here is uh, essentially I'm showing just that non-uniform distribution or an exponential style distribution. And it's not necessarily an exponential. I didn't actually model an exponential distribution. It just looks sort of like an exponential. I, I would have to fit an exponential distribution to this to understand if it really was exponential or not, which I, I'm not doing in this example. So, but what this shows is essentially an exponential style PDF. And we can again ask questions like, what's the exact value that you'll get exactly two inches of rain? When you start doing things like that, you start multiplying by a width of zero and you get things like zero, right? So we, those types of questions don't have any value when you're talking about PDFs. What we can do though, is we can start asking questions like, what's the probability that tomorrow will rain between one inch and two and a half inches? Right, so that looks like this area under the curve, you know, all under here, right? This area under the curve. And, and it shows over here, the column over here shows what the actual values are. And so what, what it ends up being is 11.6. So the total area under the curve of a PDF is always one. So you can probably, you know, kind of eyeball this and say, yeah, that looks like a roughly about 11.5%. Right, it, it at least kind of checks out from a, a visual standpoint. And of course, the math also works out.
there are a variety of distributions that are used to predict the reliability of systems or you know using data so they can kind of be broken down at least the way that I've seen this in the past is that they they kind of get broken down into two categories the first is a single parameter univariate lifetime distribution it's a bit of a mouthful um, and by and large the one that we see in this category and really the one that we use most of the time period is the exponential distribution so Exponential describes the time between consecutive, rare, random events with no memory. So the, the, one of the big things here, which we'll talk about shortly, is the, the randomness. So the, these have to be kind of fit into this idea of random failures. The mu distribution is another example, uh, just in case you're interested in looking up different distributions. Some typical two-parameter univariate distri lifetime distributions uh, would be, there's a bunch listed on the bottom, like the Poisson, log normal, gamma, so on and so forth. But uh, the most common one for the two-parameter is the Weibull. And so this, is, again, is, is used for Weibull or life data analysis. Um, it does a, a pretty good job of modeling uh, the whole entire bathtub curve, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's, it's more flexible. I mean, it's a two-parameter versus single-parameter, which literally just gives it more flexibility. And so the, uh, the second parameter, you know, sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. But Weibull, in fact, the exponential distribution, the exponential distribution is a special, ends up being a special case of the Weibull distribution. So you can, in fact, take the Weibull distribution, choose specific values for its parameters and it will turn into the exponential distribution. So you actually really, you know, if you look at it that way, you really don't even need the exponential. You could just use a Weibull, but of course it's, it's used enough to where it's sort of seen as a different one. So let's talk uh, actually about Failure rates. We'll do an example in a minute. Uh, it's kind of an interesting example. But uh, so the failure rate, we, we'd call this the rate at which random failures occur in a specified time interval. And this is a value that there's a lot of different ways to get the failure rate value. Uh, so some, some examples would be, well, the example we'll do in just a second where you've got some data. Um, in fact, if you have uh, the either the non-electric parts reliability data, which is called NPRD, or electronic parts reliability data, EPRD, you can find failure rates in those. Those are made by the Reliability Information Analysis Center, or RIAC. Mill Handbook 217F, Notice 2, the most recent version, which they stopped producing in 1992, is a way to predict failure rates based on some stresses and stuff that cause failures. Um, but ultimately, the way that we look at failure rates, well, we, first of all, we call it lambda. The way that we look at it is the number of failures that occur in a certain amount of time. Okay, and again, we'll, we'll, just, we'll talk about this in just a second with the example. It's a, a fairly basic concept, though. So here's the example. So we look at running 10 different tests, right? 10, 10 parts. We're looking to measure, we're going to run these tests for 1,000 hours. And during that time, some will fail and some will not fail, which you can see the results here in the, in the table. The goal of this activity would be to estimate the failure rate, OK? So first thing to point out is some fail and some don't fail, right? And the number that fail in this case are six. There's a total of 7,502 hours of total test time, or I would say total, total amount of time where a part is working, right? Because the total amount of test time would, in theory, be 10,000 hours. So 
7,502 hours of working time out of you know the 10,000 total allotted hours. And then each component that's failed has a specific time value in which it failed at. So you think for a second about how you would quantify based on this definition of lambda, how you would quantify the number, oh, well, how you'd quantify lambda, how you quantify the number of failures over the number of hours. So I'm not going to give too much time on this, but what it comes out to be is you take the six that failed and you estimate, well, really you add up the number of uh, failures, which is six, and then you add up the number of hours that those failures were, or that those parts were being tested and, and successfully, and that, by dividing those, you get uh, the failure rate, which is shown kind of in the top right area. So it's a pretty, a pretty basic thing. But, you know, with some of our discussion on uncertainty uh, and, and things like that, you might be asking yourself, well, how good is this number? And it's a good question because I, I wouldn't place an abundance of confidence on on finding a failure rate. Uh, well, this is actually a be much better way than most. But, uh, I mean, as you can see, for example, there were four samples that never failed. Yet, those did not have any effect on the failure rate. So I've just presented kind of a standard way that we calculate lambda, the failure rate, uh, during testing. So uh, there are some people that would, uh, in fact, include those, uh, either include or not include those thousand hours. There's really not entirely any consensus on which is correct. In this case, uh, adding having the thousand hours in there of the ones that did not fail, I would say would be more correct because those did successfully survive. But then you can ask the question, well, what happens to those components, right? Because if they're tested for another 10 hours or another 100 hours, or what about another 1,000 hours? What if they survive that time, right? What does that mean? And in fact, the what what is known as the best consensus on this problem is to, as much as possible, and this is usually restricted by the organization or the business case, when possible, test everything to failure, right? Because ultimately, what you would do with this data is you would, again, it's the time to failure is a random variable. You're going to take the time to failure, and you're going to build a PDF distribution with it. You're going to integrate that distribution to have a CDF, right? And then 1 minus the CDF is going to be the reliability, right? That's kind of the, the optimal way to do it. But in fact, it is true that a lot of times... We can only test for so long, right? Because we only have so much time and design and development cycle, so there's cutoffs. And so one of the results is we instead quantify things as failure rates, like we've done in this example, and we put those failure rates into a different model, kind of fit them to a different model. Okay, so building a little bit on the concept of failure rate, which is just a value, we can think of something that's a little bit bigger, which is the hazard rate. So this is the rate at which things fail. Um, in the case of an exponential distribution, uh, the hazard rate is just equal to lambda. And in fact, the bathtub curve uh, is probably a better way to kind of describe this. So. The failure rate, the bathtub curve is a description of the failure rate as a function of time. So it's actually the hazard function, okay? Um, the, typically, we think of the bathtub curve as, we think about this as a system level, right? So system level, all the ways it fails over its entire lifetime, and how often those failures occur. So the, the rate of failures as a function of time for a system. Okay, so there are three fairly distinct uh, areas of the bathtub curve. And just to point this out clearly, the bathtub curve is what I'm referring to on the bottom right. And this is a slightly 
more generic version of the, the bathtub curve. If you look this up online or in some books, it typically looks more, it's just a single line that's kind of a bunch of these smashed together. And it just looks like a bathtub. It exponentially goes down quickly, it flattens out, and then kind of exponentially goes up quickly in the end. It looks exactly like a bathtub. So there's a couple different types of failures that form that bathtub. The first, and, and they relate to the sections of the bathtub. So the far left side, where we see decreasing failure rate, we call this the infant mortality side of the bathtub. So it's the far left side, and this is primarily due to workmanship type failures. So the design has, so you've developed and, and tested the design and verified it, it's a good design. But what happens when we go to manufacture it is we often make mistakes, some you know early type of new mistakes, suppliers and things like that. Workmanship failures, soldering, those types of things, okay? Those, of course, go away as the organization fixes them. And so the failure rate of new units, uh, you know, it's essentially you're seeing less, less attrition. You're seeing less failures over time, okay? So eventually, in this model, the failures flatten out. And this is the constant region of the bathtub curve, which is the center section or the random failure portion. And although the picture here of the bathtub curve doesn't have values for time, it is actually wildly disproportionate to, to what is in reality. In fact, the center portion, the constant failure rate region, is typically very long. So if this were proportional, the first and third region would be about, you know, a small percentage, maybe five percentage of this graph, and the constant failure rate region would be really wide. Okay, so it'd be a sharp decrease, a very flat, and a sharp increase. So I think it's important to point that out. The center region, this constant failure rate region, is the region where we allow ourselves to use the exponential distribution and where we assume that failures are random and therefore, we can quantify them just using lambda, just a single value for lambda, right? So we see, as an example, we see a failure every, you know, 100 hours, we'll just say, every, every 1,000 hours. But they're constant, and they're, they're consistent, according to the model. So the far right side of the uh, bathtub curve is called the wear-out region. And these are end-of-life type of failures. Uh, and so these usually literally a lot of times are related to wear out. So uh, they, they tend to be like material degradation. You could imagine, uh, you know, um, some, you know, like a, a break in a car, for example, where you're wearing the material down. Eventually, it's just going to fail, right? It's, it, the, it's, the material is wearing away. It's going away. So it's going to fail eventually, right? You're going to have metal on metal and it's not going to be. Uh, useful as a break anymore. Okay, so th that's an example of a wear out failure. So those will cause, as your system ages over time, and and things usually occur in materials, cause the wear out. Then the later parts of the system, you'll start to see a higher frequency of failure, and that's when you know you're more of the wear out region. So this is an example um, of the exponential distribution, and what I've, I've shown along the bottom is the PDF and the CDF. So PDFs on the light, on the sorry, on the left, and the CDFs on the right. And so what I wanted to do is kind of make the connection between the constant failure rate region of the bathtub curve, which is lambda, which is what we just did an example for, with the PDF and CDF that we talked about earlier. So what, you think about, just think about the constant failure rate region of the bathtub curve for a minute, right? So you're expecting a failure, uh, in this example, I think I say, yeah, every 100 hours. So you're expecting every 100 hours for a failure to occur, right? So it assumes that you've chosen a random variable, uh, or sorry, a random sample. And so you can ask yourself, What's the probability that I survive in the first two hours, right? I expect a failure to occur by 100 hours. That's just 
the expectation because that we've measured the failure rate over time. Okay, so then let's think about what's my probability, what's the probability that I would see a failure within the first two hours, right? And again, within, right? So between zero and two. Uh, well, the, the probability is going to be quite low. So the value in the PDF is actually going to be quite high because it's a, it's a survivability. The probability it will not fail, okay? Then we'll say, what about five hours? What's the probability I survived the first five hours? Well, then the probability drops down a little bit, right? And what's the probability I'll survive 20 hours? Again, by the time you get to 20 hours, uh, and I think I misspoke just a second ago, I'm not talking about the area under the curve here. I'm just talking about the PDF line. I apologize. So as you go from two hours to five hours to 20 hours, uh, that system, uh, you know, assuming it has not failed, the, the probability of failure is, in fact, going down, okay? And it's going down until you get to 100 hours. By the time you get to 100 hours, it's actually not a value of 1, okay? It's kind of important. As you go to 200 hours, if you're surviving by that point, the probability, really the probability that you have survived until that point is very low, right? And 500 hours, right? So on and so forth, the, the probability goes down significantly, okay? Because it's relative to the fact that you measured this lambda that says, I expect to see a failure at about every 100 hours, right? So the probability that I make it all the way out to 200 hours, that value is going to be very low, right? The, on the PDF line, that value is going to be very low. The probability that I make it to two hours or five hours, that probability is going to be really high, okay? And then again, the CDF is taking that PDF and it's, it's integrating between zero and, and another point. It's constantly integrating that. So that's why you see the value kind of shoot up. And again, the CDF is not the reliability. The reliability is one minus that. So here's an example of the Weibull distribution. Uh, and I, I, I realized I should have actually put up the equations for the exponential distribution so you could see kind of how this uh, simplified into the exponential. But for now, let's talk about the Weibull. Um, so this, the Weibull is a, is a fairly popular way to describe um, time to failure data. Um, and, and again, Weibull is not constrained to the constant failure rate region of the bathtub curve. It is actually just uh, just fine to model the entire bathtub curve, which is really why it, it ultimately is kind of just a better model to use. Um, and it also is good, we typically think about the exponential distribution as being good for electrical components, just because the way they fail, they, they, they tend to fit better to that constant failure rate region. But Weibull is actually good for the other areas of that bathtub curve, which are not so uh, related to electrical. It can do the electrical, but it's also good for the workmanship type of failures and the mechanical type of wear out failures. So it, it, it tends to be able to model kind of a broader domain of, of uh, information, okay? So I'm showing you the PDF equation and the CDF equation. These are, uh, well, certainly not things you have to remember. You can look at it and you can see, I guess right off the bat, that, uh, for example, the Weibull distribution has an exponential component. Right? And that's that's why it's able to be uh, approximated or, you know, with certain values entered into it, it will uh, work its way down to being the exponential distribution. Okay. But anyway, so here's here are the equations. So just with those equations, take a second and run a quick calculation. So assuming that the time to failure data of an automobile or automotive component fits a Weibull distribution with an alpha value of 6.2 times 10 to the negative 5 miles, and beta is 1.3, calculate the CDF, or calculate F of T, calculate the reliability, R of T, and calculate the hazard function at the end of the warranty period of 30,000 miles. So one thing you're probably already wondering is, well, there's miles, not time. 
Okay. So again, we we don't always measure things in times. That's certainly the predominant way that we look at reliability data. But again, we can do it in stress. We can do it in miles. We can do it in any variable that we feel makes sense. Okay. And so in this case, I'm saying uh, at the end of a warranty period of 30,000 miles. So the car car has driven 30,000 miles. And that's really because uh, a lot of failures are stressed over time. That's just a, tends to be the way we model it. Whereas for something like an automobile, you know, we, we're pretty well tuned with the idea of miles. And so we can look at the stress over miles. It's, it's kind of a nice way to do it. Okay, so if you want to take a minute to do this calculation, again, here are here's a PDF and here's a CDF. Okay, I'm going to show the answer. So if you're still working on this, go ahead and pause. But I'm going to go ahead and, and show the example here. Um, so what I've actually done here in, in this case is do the same, do a bunch of calculations actually for different mile values. So in this column here, you can see the result. Here's the 30,000 line. So here's the CDF value at 30,000 miles. Uh, here's the PDF value. Uh, and here's the reliability, 67.76. I believe on the last slide I asked for H of T and I meant to ask for F of T. Uh, that was my mistake. So, uh, but here's the reliability. So the reliability, uh, the, you know, the probability of not seeing a failure by 30,000, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong line. I apologize. Uh, 30,000 30, is here. I was looking at 300,000. Well, I mean, if you're looking at 300,000, the probability you make it to 300,000 without a failure, given the data, given the, the parameters I've provided, is 67.76. But uh, the example I've given you guys is this line, so it's 98.07, okay? And uh, you can see the alpha and beta and the, the equations and stuff over here and also up here. Okay, that's all I've got today. Um, I will be posting RP2, uh, RP, RP3. Uh, the next RP assignment, as well as DP2 shortly, and I'll also be posting your DP1 grades. All right, guys. Thanks.